the Bible. It's a book that's filled with incredible examples of faith. As a matter of fact, from Genesis to Revelation, we find the people of God accomplishing incredible things by faith. They, they accomplished incredible things as they walked by faith with the Lord. And, and whether we're talking about the Old Testament saints like Enoch and Noah or Abraham and David, or maybe we're talking about the New Testament saints like Peter, Paul, James, and John, the fact is the Bible is filled with inspirational stories of believers who demonstrated a phenomenal faith. By faith, the Hebrew slaves escaped Egypt as they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. By faith, the army of Israel brought down the walls of Jericho as they simply proclaimed the praises of the Lord. By faith, Samson defeated the Philistines. By faith, David defeated a giant named Goliath. And by faith, the prophet Daniel survived the lion's den. By faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the fiery furnace. By faith, the apostles cast out demons and healed the sick. By faith, they accepted the death of martyrdom so that they could build the church upon the solid foundation of faith. Now, as we consider all of these different stories about those who demonstrated a phenomenal faith, I have no doubt that we all have our favorite Bible character. We all have our favorite story. You know, that story that we find to be the most inspirational story of faith. And, and as we consider that character that we love so much, we think, man, that's the, that's the kind of faith that I want. It's possible that your favorite story is centered around the phenomenal faith of Abraham and Sarah. Or it might be that you're more inspired by the phenomenal faith of a prophet named Jeremiah or possibly Isaiah. And while it's true that the Bible has a very long list of believers who present us with an excellent example of phenomenal faith... It's also true that the Bible actually includes an incredible example of a faith that is oftentimes overlooked by the church. And it's here in our text today where we find Luke, he's reminding his readers about the phenomenal faith which was demonstrated by a man without a revealed name. We, we find Luke writing about the phenomenal faith of an unnamed Roman soldier. And as we study the scriptures before us this morning, we'll begin to see that those who have a phenomenal faith, like that Roman soldier, that, that, that this phenomenal faith will lead us to actively seek the help of our Savior. Secondly, we'll see that those who have a phenomenal faith will also faithfully support the community of our Savior. Thirdly and finally, we'll see that those who have a phenomenal faith will humbly submit to the will of our Savior. Now, with this as our outline, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 7. Here we find Luke recounting the story of a certain unnamed centurion. As you make your way to the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel account, I want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll help us to remember that we spent the last seven weeks studying the sermon that the Lord Jesus had been presenting shortly after he appointed his apostles there on the Mount of Beatitudes. And he came down from that mount and he presented this short sermon to those who were following our Savior. And, and, and the Lord Jesus began then after this sermon was presented, he began to make his way into the Galilean city of Capernaum. And with this as the focus, if you would look with me here at Luke chapter 7, I want to pick up our study of Luke beginning at verse 1 there. There in Luke chapter 7, verse 1, Luke writes, Now when he had concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was ready, already not a, a far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority 
having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's commending the faith of this certain centurion. And just to be clear, it'll help you to know that the Greek word, which is here rendered centurion, this was used of the Roman soldier who was a captain of a hundred men. This man was in charge of a hundred soldiers. And what this means is that the Lord Jesus wasn't commending the faith of a famous Pharisee. He wasn't applauding the strong beliefs of Israel's high priest. No, instead, Jesus was complimenting the faith of a Gentile, a Gentile soldier, a soldier who was serving the Roman Empire. You might not know this, but it was during the middle of the first century BC when the Roman Empire began to occupy Israel. And, and by 4 BC, uh, you know, the people of Judea, they found themselves living under the rule of the Roman Empire. This, of course, included thousands of Roman soldiers who were sent and tasked with the responsibility of keeping the Israelites in line. What's even worse is that the Israelites, they were required to pay taxes to Rome, and you better believe that those taxes were being used to employ the Roman soldiers who were there enforcing those taxes. I mean, just, oh, that, that had to hurt. They were giving their taxes to Rome, and Rome was turning around and using those tax dollars to strategically station soldiers all throughout Israel in order to squash any insurrection against Rome. As we consider this historic context here, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that the first century Jews were completely opposed to the Roman occupation of Israel. And for several reasons. You see, the people of God were no longer in control of their own nation. Instead, they were being ruled by these uncircumcised Gentiles, most of whom were guilty of worshiping a pantheon of false gods at their pagan temples. With all this being the case, I have no doubt that the Israelites who were following Jesus were completely shocked as they heard Christ Jesus, the man uh, who, who they just listened to preaching at the base of the, the Mount of Beatitudes. Now he's turning around and honoring the great faith of, of a Roman centurion. Look with me again there in the middle of verse nine. There again, the Lord Jesus declares, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. It'll help you to know that the word faith there is translated from a Greek word which was used of the strong conviction that a belief is true. I like the way that Paul put it in Hebrews chapter 11. There he tells us that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. While it's true that the children of Israel were called to walk by faith with the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, it's also true that the Jews there in the first century, well, they had a lot to learn about faith from this Roman centurion. In light of his example, we should take a moment to ask, you know, how would Jesus describe our faith? If Jesus showed up today here at our church and, and began to describe your faith, what words would he use? Would he refer to our faith as a phenomenal faith? Or would Jesus challenge our wavering faith by encouraging us to follow in the footsteps of that Roman centurion? Do you have the great faith of, of that Roman centurion or is your faith less than phenomenal? Now, before we rush to answer this question, let's take some time to consider the reasons for why the Lord Jesus described the faith of this centurion as a great faith. And with this as our focus, let's back up. Let's take a closer look at our text today, beginning at Luke 7. I want to draw your attention back to verse 2. Here again, Luke tells us that a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews, uh, of the Jews to him, uh, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. Now, here in these verses, we find this unnamed soldier showing his concern for his personal employee. You know, he, he had a servant that was sick and ready to die. And so he was searching for solutions. I'm guessing that he was seeking out physicians and, and he was looking for someone who could help heal his sick servant. And I have no doubt 
that he was excited when he heard about the miraculous ministry of our Messiah Jesus. He was excited after he heard about this miracle worker named Jesus. Luke even tells us that when he heard about Jesus, he quickly sent those Jewish elders to go and plead with Jesus, to beg Jesus that he might come and heal his servant. Now, the implication of this invitation infers that uh, the faith of the man who truly believed that Jesus could heal his servant. Remember, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us the assurance about the things that we can't yet see. Or we might put it like this, faith is a belief that includes a, a, pre, a predominant idea of trust, which results in a confident conviction that Christ Jesus is able to save us. And as we consider the way that the Lord Jesus commended the faith of that soldier, we can also be certain that it was the faith of that soldier that led him to seek help from our Savior. In light of his example here, we can draw the conclusion that those who have a phenomenal faith, well, this phenomenal faith will actively seek our Savior. If we have a phenomenal faith, then we will demonstrate that faith as we actively seek our Savior. At the same time, it's also important for us to understand that the curse of Adam will keep an unbeliever from actively seeking our Savior. This was precisely the point that Paul was making in Romans chapter 3, where he declares, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. In other words, the unrepentant believer, the unrepentant unbeliever, I should say, the unrepentant unbeliever will never initiate the search for God. And the reason why is because of our sin nature. With that being the case, we should take a moment to ask, how can an unbeliever develop the desire or the faith to actively seek our Savior? Well, with this question in mind, let's consider something that Paul wrote in his letter to the Christians in Ephesus. If you would hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And as you make your way to the first chapter of Ephesians, I just want to take a moment to point out that the Roman centurion wasn't the one who initiated his search for our Savior. No, instead, he began to seek the help of our Savior after hearing about the miraculous ministry of the Messiah. He didn't just wake up one day and, and, and think, I need to seek out the Messiah. No, the, the Israelites came and told him about this Messiah. And after he heard the good news about Jesus, he invited the Lord into his home. In light of his example, I want to consider something that Paul wrote here in Ephesians chapter 1. Look with me there, beginning at verse 11. Here Paul declared, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted when? After you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping the Christians there in Ephesus to understand that they didn't initiate their search for the Savior. They didn't just wake up one day and decide, you know, I'm going to go see if there's a Savior out there. No, instead, they began to actively seek our Savior after they heard the word of truth, which is the gospel or the, or the good news about the way in which the Lord Jesus is able to save us from the sick bed of our sin. What this means then is that the Lord, he's given us his holy word so that we might have the faith that we need to seek our savior. He's given us his word and he's, he's sent out evangelists to proclaim the, 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 the word of truth and the gospel message so that people can hear the good news. And as they hear the good news of God's word, they begin to have a faith that develops within their heart. I think that Paul put it best in Romans chapter 10, it's verse 17 where he declares, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, those who want to develop a phenomenal faith must first receive the truth of God's word. And much like the centurion who decided to seek our savior after hearing about the miraculous ministry of our Messiah, the Lord has also provided us with the eyewitness accounts that we find in the word of God so that every unbeliever might have the faith that we need to seek the help 
and the salvation of our Savior Jesus. It's for this reason that I encourage Christians to, to seek the Lord every day through the study of his word, and not only that, but to go out and proclaim the word so that others might hear and by hearing believe. But if we're going to have a phenomenal faith, we must spend time ourselves seeking the Lord through the study of his word. I like the way that the prophet Isaiah put it in the word of God. It's in Isaiah chapter 55, where he declares, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. We are to seek the Lord. Paul presented a very similar word of encouragement while he was in Athens, Greece. It's actually found in Acts chapter 17, where Paul helped the philosophers there in Athens to understand that the Lord has called us to seek him in the hope that we might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Listen, those who want to develop a phenomenal faith must hear the word of truth, which is the gospel of our salvation. And then after hearing about the miraculous ministry of the Messiah, we ought to seek our Savior knowing that he is not far from us. And as we enter into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we should continue seeking our Savior through the study of his word. And while it's true that those who have a phenomenal faith will actively seek the help of our Savior, listen, it's also true that those who have a phenomenal faith will faithfully support the community of our Savior. And with this as the focus, let's make our way back to Luke chapter 7. Here we find more about the phenomenal faith of this Roman centurion. If you would, let's consider the way that the Jews describe this Gentile soldier. If you would, look with me there beginning at verse 4. Here again, Luke tells us that when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Now, here in these verses, we find the elders of Capernaum. They're approaching Jesus with the request of that soldier. It's important to, to remember that they were presenting this request on behalf of this Roman centurion who desperately wanted Jesus to come and heal his servant. And according to Luke, these elders, they begged and they pleaded with Jesus, all in an attempt to convince Jesus that this unnamed centurion was deserving of the request. They believed that he was des deserving of this visit. And the reason why is due to the fact that this military man had consistently demonstrated his love for the people of God. Notice with me again there in verse five. Here again, the elders of Capernaum describe the centurion in this way, that he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. In other words, this certain centurion was well respected by the Israelites who were there in Capernaum. And the reason why is due to the fact that he had faithfully shown his support for their community. Now, as we consider the way that he actually built the synagogue there in Capernaum, he built this, this place of worship for the Israelites, uh, th there's reason for us to think that this, this uh, you know, certain centurion had possibly become a God-fearer, which is to say that he was a Gentile who had converted to the Jewish religion without actually undergoing the process of circumcision. We can't say for certain if this centurion had become a convert to Judaism. But what we can say for sure is this, that, that his support of the community there in Capernaum was evidence of his faith in the God of Israel. Think about it. He loved the people of God so much that he happily used his own finances to commission the construction of a synagogue for their community of faith. And not only that, but he also loved his servant so much, who was more than likely Jewish. He loved his servant so much that he actually sought the help of our Savior by begging him to come and save his servant from certain death. At the same time, he also realized that he didn't actually deserve the favor of the Lord as the elders claimed. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me again there in the middle of verse 6, here again we learn that the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. He sent this second group out just saying, I don't deserve this. I'm unworthy of this visit. The elders of Capernaum, they insisted that he was deserving of this request, but the Roman centurion himself was quick to insist that he was entirely unworthy of the Lord's favor. And in this way, we can see that his faith in the, uh, was in the Lord and not in his own good works. 
If his faith was in his good works, then he would have been like, hey, yeah, I built a synagogue. You know, you, you owe this to me. I've demonstrated my love for, for the, the people of Israel. And so I deserve you to come to my house. No. He said, I'm not worthy. As we consider the phenomenal faith of the soldier that, that, that we find here in our text today, it's important for us to understand that we aren't saved by our good works. No one should ever make the mistake of thinking that, well, I've done all of this for Jesus and therefore I deserve to go to heaven. I've done all this for Jesus. I, I've given this much money to the church. I've served in this way. I've done all these things. I've preached the gospel and, and this is why I deserve to enter into the kingdom of God. No. We aren't saved by good works. At the same time, those who are saved will engage in good works as we faithfully support our Christian community. And with this as the focus, I want to consider something that James wrote in his epistle. If you would hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, let's turn in our Bibles to James chapter 2. You see, it's here in the second chapter of James' epistle where we find James. He's helping his audience to understand that those who actually have a phenomenal faith will demonstrate the evidence of that faith as we engage in good works. If you say you have faith in Jesus, the question is how do you prove that faith to the people that are watching? And that's exactly what James is talking about here in James chapter two. Look with me there beginning at verse 14. Here James asks, what does it profit my brethren if somebody, someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. It's important to understand here that James wasn't suggesting that faith plus works equals salvation. This is the common misinterpretation of this text. A lot of people, a lot of cults will come straight to James chapter two and they'll say, see right here, you know, faith plus works equals salvation. No, that's not what James said. He's saying that if you claim you have faith and it doesn't result in works, it's a dead faith. It's not a real faith. If you claim to have faith, show me. If you say you have faith in Jesus Christ, show me. Show me that faith and how it works. Otherwise, it's just words. It's like me standing up here and saying, you know, you know I'm, I'm six foot eight and play for the NBA. I can say it all day long. Proves nothing. A person can claim to have faith. James is saying, hey, you say you have faith, show me. Let's see how you work it out. He's helping his audience to understand that those who have been saved by faith will show the evidence of saving faith as they demonstrate that phenomenal faith. And, and the way that we do this is by faithfully supporting those within our Christian community. And, and with that being the case, we should take a moment to ask, do I have a dead faith that fails to work? Or do I have a phenomenal faith that leads me to support those in my Christian community? With this question in mind, I want to consider the example of faith that was demonstrated by the first century saints back in Jerusalem. Continue holding your place there in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. And as you make your way to the second chapter of Acts, I want to take a moment to point out that it's here in this historic account where we find Luke, he's presenting us with a summary of the way in which the people of faith there in the primitive church, they began to support one another from Jump Street. I mean, it was from the word go that they just began to support one another. With this context in focus, I want to consider the phenomenal faith of those in the first century church. Look with me there at Acts chapter 2. We'll begin reading at verse 41. Here Luke writes, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together 
and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Here in these verses, we find Luke describing the way that the early church showed their support for one another within their Christian community. And just to to recap what I'm saying here, notice back in verse 42, there we learn that they continued steadfastly as they listened to the apostles' doctrine. And they continued in fellowship. In verse 44, we learn that all who believed were together. They weren't divided. Not only that, but we also learned there that they had all things in common. They sought the, the common leadership of Jesus Christ. And in verse 45, Luke tells us that they supported one another with their finances according to the needs of the community. And in verse 46, we learn that they devoted themselves to meeting together every single day. I mean, that's quite the commitment. I don't know that you could stand me every single day. At least that's what Brenda tells me. But these guys were worshiping the Lord together every single day. Without debate, the first century saints there in Jerusalem had phenomenal faith. And it was their faith in Jesus that led them to support one another spiritually and theologically and emotionally, practically and financially. And in every way that they could, they supported one another. As a result, their fellowship of faith ended up making an impact on the rest of the people there in Jerusalem. Their fellowship of faith made an impact on their community beyond the church. As they continued to sing the praises of God and and, and worship the Lord daily, the Lord daily added to the church those who were being saved. With that being the case, I encourage every Christian to make sure that we have this sort of phenomenal faith that leads us to support one another as we engage in the good works that the Lord is leading us to be a part of. In this way, we'll not only provide support for one another, but we'll make an impact on our city that will result in further salvations. From this, we see then that those who have a phenomenal faith will actively seek the help of our Savior. And not only that, but those who have a phenomenal faith will faithfully support the community of our Savior as, as we you know, work together together to accomplish the Great Commission. Thirdly and finally, I want to consider how those who have a phenomenal faith will humbly submit to the will of our Savior. And with this as the focus, let's make our way now back to Luke chapter 7. Here we find more about the phenomenal faith of this unnamed soldier. Let's consider the way that the Jews described that Gentile soldier. uh, And let's, let's consider, you know, how he continued to, uh, you know, walk in humility with the Lord. It's here in verse 6 where Luke tells us that Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it. And here in these verses, we find this centurion, he's continuing to confess his unworthiness. And listen, this wasn't some sort of false humility. You know, it's not like he sent these guys to go find Jesus because he just couldn't be bothered with it. You know, I'm just, I'm just so busy as a centurion, you know, that I can't even go and, and, and attempt to approach the Lord. I'm just so busy. No, he sent the elders And he sent the second group because he didn't feel worthy to even go and approach Jesus in a public setting. This was not false humility. You know, false humility, it's a twisted form of pride. It's it's an air of humility, but at the heart of it, pride. You know, there's some people who who go through uh, what's called self-deprecation. You know, they put themselves down, but the heart behind the, the self-deprecation is looking for the compliment. You know, like, like when a skinny person says, oh, I feel so fat today. Yeah, that's what you feel. 
Don't, these skinny people, don't, don't, don't. Don't look for the compliment. You know, there's people who have obvious skills. They're good at something, right? But then they're just kind of like, I just wish I was so much better, you know? I'm just not as good as, don't, that's, that's false. That's not real humility. If your self-deprecating comments are offered in order to gain the compliment of another, then this isn't humility. This is pride disguised as humility. We can be certain that the Roman soldier was not putting on an air of humility. He wasn't saying, oh, I'm not worthy to have you at my house, but in, in reality, I am worthy. No. This guy truly believed that he wasn't even worthy enough to approach Jesus in public, let alone have Jesus enter his home. Not only that, but he also sent the elders to, to present his request of help because, you know, like, like I said, he didn't feel worthy enough to, to approach the Lord. And yet at the same time, this centurion also had the, the same phenomenal faith that caused him to demonstrate a complete confidence in the authority of Jesus' word. As a matter of fact, look with me again there in the middle of verse 7. Here again, the centurion declares, say the word and my servant will be healed. In all humility, he's saying, I can't even approach you, but then turns around and says, you know, I totally believe in your authority. Just say the word and my servant will, will be healed. And then he goes on to explain his mentality here in verse eight. He says, I'm also a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. He's saying, hey, I understand how to respond to the authority above me. And I know how, you know, to, to give the word to those under me. He knows how to say go to one and he goes and to another come and he comes and to the servant do this and he does it. He knows all about the person who has authority. And this faith of the centurion it was demonstrated by the fact that he believed that when Jesus spoke a word, he spoke with authority. Not only that, but listen, the centurion also believed that the Lord Jesus had authority over sickness and death. Because that's the context here. He's saying, just say a word and my servant will be healed. The centurion is saying, you have authority over sickness. You have authority over death. And you can just speak a word and heal my servant. That's quite a faith. He was saying, hey, you know, just say the word and my servant will be healed. He'll, he'll, he'll recover from the deathbed that he's on. In this way, the centurion was revealing his phenomenal faith, which gave him complete confidence in our Savior's authority, even over death itself. And listen, I encourage you to have the same faith. I encourage you to have the same phenomenal faith by believing the promise that Jesus made to those who trust in him. The promise I'm referring to, it's found in John chapter 3, verse 16. There the Lord Jesus tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever places their faith in Jesus Christ will not perish in the fires of hell. No, instead we will enter into the everlasting joy of eternal life as we're ushered into the presence of our Savior forevermore. That's the promise that Jesus made. And when he presented the promise, he spoke with authority. He spoke with authority over sin. He spoke with authority over death. And with that being the case, I encourage every person to follow in the example of that centurion's faith by humbly submitting our lives to the authority of Jesus' word. Much like that centurion who believed the, the, the authoritative word of Jesus Christ, we too ought to have a faith that believes in the authoritative word of Jesus Christ. And as we do, the Lord will reward our faith. And in order to prove my point, let's, let's look again there at verse nine. Here in Luke chapter seven, verse nine, Luke tells us that when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, he turns around and, and, and says to all of these Israelites, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Sick burn. Just wow. Had to hurt. And those who were sent, verse 10, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. 
Here in the final verses of our text today, we see how the Lord blessed the phenomenal faith of that centurion. The Lord blessed his faith by healing his servant. As a matter of fact, the centurion's servant was already healed by the time the elders finally made it back to the soldier's home. He was already healed. He's up doing his thing. In light of this story, we can see that the Lord Jesus truly does have authority over sin and death. Don't you doubt it? He truly does have authority over sin and death. And not only that, but he truly does bless those who by faith will humbly submit to the authority of his word. That being the case, we should take a moment to ask, do I humbly submit to the word of God by faith in Jesus Christ? Or am I still protecting my own personal autonomy according to foolish pride? With this question in mind, I want to consider something that James wrote in the fourth chapter of his epistle. If you would, let's turn to James chapter four. And as you make your way to James four, I just want to take a moment to remind you that the centurion could have commanded Jesus to come to his home. The centurion just could have just given the order. Think about it, it, just on the earthly level here. He was a Roman soldier who was sent to occupy the land of Israel. He was a Roman soldier who had authority over every Israelite. Therefore, he had the authority to command Jesus to come to his house. He could have just given the order, Jesus, you come to my house now. I'm a Roman soldier and you have to do what I say. He could have. But rather than using his authority to order Jesus, the centurion humbly submit to the authority of Jesus. He set aside his authority in recognition of Jesus' greater authority. And in light of his example, we should take a moment to examine our own lives by asking, am I using my personal autonomy to force my will upon the Lord? You know, some Christians act like this. Well, I can name and claim whatever I want with God, and if I claim it with enough faith, then he has to do whatever I said. Hmm. I don't know if that's the case. I think we would do well to humbly submit to the authority of our Savior as we obey his holy word and accept whatever he decides for our life. Are we humbly following the footsteps of that centurion or are we allowing our foolish pride to keep us from experiencing the miraculous ministry of the Messiah? Are we humbly drawing near to the Lord or are we too proud to submit to the instructions of God's word? With these questions in mind, let's consider the encouragement that James presents here in James chapter four. Look with me there beginning at verse four. Here James declares, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Here in these verses, we find James helping his audience to realize that God will actively resist those who are too proud to submit to his authority. If you want God to actively resist you, then by all means. Don't submit to his authority and you'll soon find yourself being resisted by God himself. At the same time, the Lord has also promised to raise up those who choose to humbly submit to our Savior. And with that being the case, James encouraged us to walk in the obedience of faith as we humbly submit our, our lives to the authority of God's word. And with this as the goal, I want to take a moment to ask, well, how can we know if we are in fact humbly submitting to the authority of the Lord? How can we make sure that we're humbly submitting to the authority of the Lord? And with this question in mind, I want to consider the encouragement that Peter presented in his first epistle. If you would, let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. And as you make your way to the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, 
I just want to take a moment to remind you of the way in which the, the Christians back at the, the primitive church there in Jerusalem, they continued together. They continued steadfastly, first of all, in the apostles' doctrine, as well as in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. In other words, the first century saints were humbly submitting to the authority of God's word by abiding in the, the, the fellowship of the Christian church according to the leadership structure that God designed. Now, with their example in mind, I want to consider how Peter put it. It's here in 1 Peter chapter 5. I want, to, I want to draw your attention to verse 1 where Peter declares, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. Here in these verses, we find the apostle Peter, he's encouraging every Christian to demonstrate humble submission to the authority of the Lord by learning how to serve the Lord together according to the hierarchy of leadership that the Lord has ordained for every church. Pastors have been called to submit to the chief shepherd. The, the, the saints have been called to submit to the leadership uh, that the, the pastor has structured for the church. And, and as we submit together, we demonstrate our submission to the word of God and to the authority of Jesus Christ. As we consider the instructions that Peter presented here in this epistle, we should take a moment to then ask, am I truly submitting to the authority of God's word? Am I truly submitting to the authority of God's word? Christian, listen, the believer who is humbly submitting to the word of God will demonstrate their submission as they cooperate, co cooperate with the leaders of their church. And how do I know this? Because this is what it says right here in 1 Peter. If you're submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ, then you're submitting to the authority of his word. And if you're submitting to the authority of his word, then you're following what Peter says here in 1 Peter 5. It's that simple. So how do I know if I'm truly submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ? I'm submitting to the authority of his word. How do I know if I'm truly submitting to the authority of his word? I'm following the instructions that Peter presented here in this epistle. Therefore, those who have a phenomenal faith will set aside the pride of self-reliance. We will set aside our, our desire for autonomy. And instead, we will humbly submit to the authority of Jesus Christ as we cooperate together according to the leadership structure that the Lord has ordained for our church. And in this way, our church will be blessed as we walk in humble submission with our Savior according to his holy word. Now, with all this in mind, I just want to wrap up our study today by encouraging every Christian to examine the quality of their faith. Do we have the sort of faith that the Lord Jesus would celebrate like that Roman centurion? If he showed up here today, would he say of you, oh, this person right here, they have such a great faith. Would that be true of you or, or is our faith more like the Israelites that were following Jesus, but they were following with a wavering faith? They loved them one day and couldn't stand them the next. And it was just, you know, this roller coaster ride of faith with them for a while. If you have a faith that's constantly wavering, then I encourage you to remember that those who have a phenomenal faith will actively seek the help of our Savior each and every day because we'll recognize that we desperately need his help every single day. Those who have a phenomenal faith will faithfully support the community of our Savior. And we do this by plugging in and helping to make this the best place to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who have a phenomenal faith will humbly submit to the will of our Savior as we cooperate with one another according to the word of God. And with all of this as our goal, I encourage you in closing. Let's follow in the footsteps of faith, which were demonstrated by that Roman soldier 
that unnamed soldier who needed zero recognition for himself. He didn't come to Luke and say, hey, you forgot my name. He wasn't concerned about that. He wasn't concerned about making a name for himself. He was only concerned about submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. In light of his example, let's follow in his footsteps of faith. And as we do, we can rejoice in knowing that our Savior will be glorified by our phenomenal faith.